Coming up, inside a church without walls. I saw love is what I saw. And see how it's changing lives throughout the community. What they professed on Sunday, they began to walk it out during the week. And then, the woman who became famous on YouTube against her will. I didn't find that at all. How she showed the world the face of true beauty. I was the happiest kid in the world. On today's 700 Club. Oh, the weekend is over, and we're having another week, and the vice president walked out of a football game because the people sat during the national anthem, and the president has got a fight on his hands with Congress about immigration. Oh, isn't it nice to be in the U.S. of A. Yeah. Happy Monday. Happy, happy, Monday. happy Indigenous People's yeah, Day. Happy Indigenous <laughs> People's Day. What in the we're, world is happening yeah, to we, us? We're doing away with Columbus because he wasn't nice to the Indians. Oh, mercy. They said, you know, if it wasn't for Columbus, we wouldn't have had any Hispanics. Yeah. And the Hispanics are saying, we don't like Columbus. Well, they, 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 some. Yeah. I think there are some who are standing up and saying, you know, we... We like Columbus. Mm -hmm. Well, they want to tear statues down. They want to take all these na names out. And Oh, Lord. Is it ever going to end? The answer is no. But look, people were concerned, and I'm one of them, for these dreamers, that we ought to let the dreamers into this country because they deserve it. They, they're good people, and they're hardworking, and they're great citizens. Okay. Well, the president has said to these people like me and the Democrats who want to let dreamers in, he said, okay, I'll let them stay in, but I want to make a deal. I'm a deal maker, and I want enough money to build a wall along the southern border. Well, the Democrats aren't about to go along with that, so they're fighting again. All right. <laughs> surprise, surprise, right? Yeah. Well, the president has given Congress his list of demands, but as Jenna Browder reports, it's already running into opposition from Democrats. President Trump is doubling down on immigration reform and looking to make a deal. But Democrats say his demands have long been off the table. But this is a celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, right? The president Friday saluting Hispanic Heritage Month at the White House. From our earliest days, Hispanic Americans have enriched our country and helped shape our history. Praising the contributions of Hispanics. But on Sunday, a different tone, taking a strong stance against those who enter the country illegally. In a letter to congressional leaders, he lists his priorities, many of which Democrats say threaten to derail ongoing negotiations over protecting dreamers. The typical person on DACA came to this country at six years of age, obviously through no will of their own. Last month, Trump announced that he was ending the DACA program, but gave Congress six months to come up with a fix. Now his list of demands includes overhauling the country's green card system, a crackdown on unaccompanied minors entering the country, and building his promised wall along the southern border. The White House says it also wants to boost fees at border crossings, hire 10,000 more immigration enforcement officers, make it easier to deport gang members and unaccompanied children, and a new measure to tighten the reins on sanctuary cities. You know when the president says, make America great again? What his people here make America white again. Just last month, he met with Democrats Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, where he agreed to extend DACA protections in exchange for a package of border security measures. But responding to this new list of demands in a joint statement, Schumer and Pelosi say the president's list fails to, quote, represent any attempt at compromise, adding that the wall was, quote, explicitly ruled out of negotiations. The president's demands could also divide Republicans, many of whom have drafted legislation providing a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Speaker Paul Ryan says House members will review the list and consult with the White House. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Don't you wish there was something that could happen in Washington that's not political? Don't you wish there was something the Democrats would go along with that the president would want? If we wait long enough, the cherry blossoms will bloom. The cherry blossoms. <laughs> that they, might be it. Oh, there'll be some <laughs> fight about the cherry blossoms. Well, they're not Democrat cherry blossoms. They're Republican <laughs> cherry blossoms. They were put in by some, uh, 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 they say Columbus planted them. We better cut them all down. I mean, you know, it's crazy. 
ladies and gentlemen. But anyhow, there's something that's interesting that the Trump Justice Department is doing. You remember that cake baker out there in, where is it, Oregon? Where, where they, they uh, excuse me, Colorado, uh, Colorado, uh, where uh, they sued the guy uh, under the state law because he said, I cannot in good conscience make a wedding cake for a gay couple to get married. So I don't believe in gay marriage. So, okay, they sued him and they fined him. And there was one of those things where the, the fines continued every day he did it. And it mounted up to a huge fine. So, okay, he is uh, coming up now. And the Trump de uh, uh, Justice Department says, no, no, no way. We don't agree with Colorado on that one. We think that there should be religious freedom in America. The uh, religious beliefs of people are paramount. And they take, should take a stand against this gay law that's come into effect. Now, I was talking to our producer about the thing. And well, is that law, the federal right, is that going to trump the uh, state law or not? I think it should, but I don't know how they're going to interpret it. So this is going to be up for grabs. But I, I think that cake baker should get off the hook. They ought to, you know, the Justice Department obviously is not going to sue him. And the Colorado people shouldn't sue him. And maybe they can preempt the Colorado action uh, and, and make it a federal action. But it's high time we stood up for religious freedom in this country. You know, the First Amendment, the most important thing, listen, <coughs> First Amendment, <coughs> Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise. That, that clause has not been legislated, like it, uh, litigated like it should have. Uh, we have not really had uh, landmark cases on it. There have been a whole lot of them on establishment. Oh, this is establishment of religion. This is terrible. This is establishment of religion. Violates the First Amendment, blah, blah, blah. But what about the most important part of it, the free exercise? Well, that cake baker, you're saying, I, under the First Amendment, have free exercise to make the kind of cake I want. And the Justice Department has said, we agree with you. John Jessup's got the story. Well, Pat, Attorney General Jeff Sessions sent out word to all department heads in the Justice Department and all U.S. attorneys telling them that federal law will be used to protect religious freedom, saying the president instructed him to do so. Sessions' guidance includes 20 key principles of religious liberty, which make clear religious freedom is protected in the workplace and that the government can't force people to act in violation of their religious beliefs. You can find an in-depth explanation of Sessions' key points, including how they protect both individuals and organizations, on our website, cbnnews.com. Well, the National Mall here in Washington was filled with an unprecedented event this weekend, worship around the clock, and to call the presence of God down on America. Paul Strand was there and brings us that story. Think how much a father loves it when his children just stop to love him and praise him. Now imagine God the Father with thousands of his children gathered on the National Mall in 57 tents just for the purpose of loving and worshiping him. And it's all about King Jesus, okay? We are lifting his name up. It says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. We want to see the third great awakening. Every state in the union here is represented by Holy Ghost, Christian people of, of all races and colors that's here to worship the King of Kings. And all of those states and regions with their own tents were lifting up praise and adoration 24 hours a day, all weekend long. Nothing like this endless stream of worship from Capitol Hill all the way down to the Washington Monument has ever happened in the center of the nation's capital. Kent Henry's been a worship leader and Christian recording artist since the 1970s. I hope a lot of churches c catch a, a draft off of this, bro, because if, if everyday believers start praying 20 minutes a day, I mean, with, including with some worship in it, things will start changing in America. It's coming back to the King of Kings, coming back to the God of America, coming back to the Statue of Liberty. It's not that thing in New York City. It's the cross. It's the cross that set us free. That's our Statue of Liberty. Not just worship, but preaching and prayer also filled the air. In order to carry compassion to a lost and dying world, we need to be filled with the passion of Christ. 
Heidi Baker of Iris Global was on hand, all the way from Mozambique, where she's helped establish thousands of churches. She had an overflow crowd falling to their knees and crying out to God. On the main stage, Mark Gonzalez of the Hispanic Action Network led powerful prayer against racial and political division. Well, not only that, we're no longer going to get caught up in power to the people. We're coming in power to Almighty God over the nation of America. Because I believe prayer changes history. Nations were founded. Israel was founded in 1948 through prayer. The people crying out for a land and they got a land, amen. We're, we're pretty far down the stream morality-wise and ethics, but now we got a shot, especially with the change of the presidency, to do something great for Jesus. So hungry people still get filled. We need to see the fire of the Lord come again. Okay. True, the purpose of Awaken the Dawn was just to love on the Lord and worship Him. But believers here have a feeling that God's not going to let it in there, that He's going to show some love to the nation that showed it to Him. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the National Mall. Thanks, Paul. And we'll have a report on today's Christian rally, Rise Up the Call, also here in Washington, on tomorrow's 700 Club. Well, President Trump says he won't move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem yet. That's what he told former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee on his new TV show, saying that he first wants to give a chance to a peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Meanwhile, Trump's ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, says he'll still push to relocate the embassy. Pat, back to you. I think that's a promise. You know, we've built that thing. We've got it ready. We've got the land and so forth. I, I don't know if it's constructed or not, but uh, this has been held up forever by the State Department for fear of offending the Arabs. Why would it offend the Arabs? Uh, let's face it. The United States uh, has a perfect right to uh, put its embassy where the capital of a sovereign nation is. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And it is not Tel Aviv, it is Jerusalem. And all of the major offices of the Israeli government are located in Jerusalem. And it's time we stop this fiction. And Donald Trump said he was going to do it, uh, and uh, stop the fiction, I should say, and build the embassy. And uh, why would you worry that the, the Muslims aren't going to do anything if we put an embassy in Jerusalem? I mean, let's face it, give peace a chance. They're going to object to something, whatever it is, whether it's the embassy or something else, or apartments being built or something else. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Let's, let's face it and get on with life. John. Well, Pat, along those lines, at a time of rising anti-Semitism, thousands of Christians have traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the biblical Feast of Tabernacles and to stand with Israel. Chris Mitchell brings us that story. They came from the ends of the earth for the six day celebration. It's the invitation of Zechariah the prophet uh, in chapter 14, uh, verse 16 of the book of Zechariah. Uh, he envisions a time when all the nations will come up, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, worship the Lord here, and we're like forerunners. More than 5,000 Christians from nearly 100 nations came here on opening night to proudly stand with Israel and celebrate the biblical feast of tabernacles. In the end of the day, it's God's faithfulness that is, has established for almost 40 years now this international gathering of the body of Christ in a unique way that you can't find anywhere else. The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem sponsors the celebration the organization started in 1980, after 13 countries moved their embassies from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, protesting Israel's declaration of the city as its eternal capital. Israel's victory in the 1967 Six-Day War made that possible by uniting Jerusalem. So this is a special year for the feast. And what's really exciting, it's a jubilee year for Jerusalem. We're marking 50 years since the city of Jerusalem was reunited back under Jewish sovereignty. More than half of those celebrating are first timers. Well, we're part of a 26 strong Cook Island delegation and we're here to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and we're about to be registered as a nation with ICEJ for the first time ever. Early on this year, God asked me to come to represent the nation of Samoa. So I brought a team of 20 people. So we're here happily from the ends of the earth. And we ask why they stand strongly with Israel. It's the biggest proof that God is alive. You have the Jews coming back, you have the land flourishing. Because the Bible says so. Israel has given to many nations. It's been a blessing to a lot of nations all over the world. 
and it's time to pay back. Jews are the God's chosen nation and I mean, you don't want to go against God, that's all I can say. <laughs> Chris Mitchell, the Pice Arena, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Looks like they had a great time. Pat, back to you. It's a great celebration. I had the privilege of speaking to that a few years ago. There was such an anointing of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was powerful. I think they must have moved the venue. There was, when I was there, there weren't as many people as they are now. That's yeah. a huge venue. Where huge venue. Yeah. It's wonderful to see a group that oh, size yeah. all in unity, all looking outward together in the same direction. Hey, we've got something else coming up. It'll, it'll, this will warm your heart. We've had all these bad things. This is something going on in Dallas you love. Well, coming up in a city where homeless camps have multiplied in the last few years, one man's taking the church to the streets. I was free raising cocaine when I got saved, and I didn't care if I lived or died. And so I, I can understand where they're coming from. We'll take you inside this outdoor church. But first, time for your questions and some honest answers. Linda says, recently my church decided to take the word Christian out of its name. They've not told us why. What are your thoughts on this? Pat weighs in on that and more. It's all next. Well, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Linda, who says, I've been attending my church since 1989. I was saved there, baptized there, and raised my children there. When I started attending, there were 400 members. Now there are about 60,000, which is great. Recently, they decided to change the name and take the word Christian out of the name. Nobody seems to have the answer as to why this decision was made. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know enough about it. I mean, did they change the name to Baptist, or did they change it to Lutheran, or Methodist, or Presbyterian? That's what usually you have over churches. Uh, there, there, there are not too many Christian churches. Of course, that's a separate denomination. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, <clears throat> I really don't, don't know. I tell you, there was one organization that I, they probably will jump on me for this, but uh, uh, it was called the Christian Children's Fund. It was located oh, in Richmond, sure, Virginia. Yeah. It was a wonderful charity, and uh, uh, I, I thought was, you know, a great fan of what they were doing. They took the name Christian out of it and changed it to the Child Fund. You remember? Really, I didn't know they did and that. And it was like somebody stuck a knife in my heart. It was just something about it that, that to me, was just terrible. Now I don't know what they've done in this church. It, maybe it was called Christian and now it's called Presbyterian. I don't know. So I'm, I, mm -hmm. I, well, what is my comment? I can't comment. Okay, right. this is a viewer who says, I am a pilot. I got fired from my work on July 2nd this year, 2017, where I made about $90,000. My wife was devastated. I told her not to be. I've been praying and asking God to help me. It's now October and I don't have a job yet. I still have faith, but I do need help. What am I doing wrong? Well, what you're doing wrong is probably not selling yourself. I, you know, people got to know you're around, and uh, you have to go where people are hiring pilots. Um, you know, th there is a demand uh, for uh, private uh, commercial, I mean, for private pilots. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are commercial opportunities available, which means you may have to upgrade your skills. But uh, I think if you're a good pilot and you have good experience and you have good references, there shouldn't be too much trouble finding a position uh, with a uh, uh, organization or, or uh, that ha has its own <clears throat> private planes. I notice, however, GE is just going to sell a whole bunch of their planes, so maybe some of them are downgrading, but I think you can find a job. So just get out there and look for it. Don't be sitting around waiting for a knock to come on the door. You start knocking on their doors and answering ads and applying where there are places that you never can tell where an opportunity will open up. All right. This is Rhonda who says, I'm a teacher and a parent. Over the years, I've noticed children carrying very heavy backpacks loaded with textbooks and considerable amounts of homework. For years, I've been alarmed and concerned about the health components of this. I'm just referring to the physical issue with weighty backpacks, although there are other issues that can be brought up here as well. Just last week, my 14-year-old's backpack was about 30 pounds. How could I approach doing something about this and advocating for children in our country? Any well, thoughts? You can join the PTA, the Parent Teachers Association, 
uh, you can get involved with many uh, uh, groups. I, I think it's not a heavy lift to, to uh, uh, advocate for child, children's health. Mm -hmm. And I do think those backpacks are stressing those young bodies beyond what they need. You know, if, if, if a child is under a load beyond what his physical body can, can stand, he will wind up with some kind of curvature, some kind mm -hmm. of arthritis, some kind of damage. And I, I think, I, I know what you're talking about, and I totally agree with you. Let's make a noise. Put, go to the local television station. Get people together and begin a crusade. There are all things you can do, and I think the school board will, will, will want to stop on that one real fast. All right. This is a viewer who says, my story and question is that I lived with a man for 10 years. He had five children by four different women. He had no money, no home, and no credit. I took him into my home and helped him for all those years. He told me he would help me when his child support was done. Well, all his child support fell off and he walked away from me at the worst time in my life. It was 12 hours after I found out my father was full of cancer. My father passed away 12 weeks later. I was so hurt when I went through all this alone. I think everything inside of me broke. I keep asking for karma to come back on him, but nothing <laughs> happens. I just found out he got married 18 months after doing all this bad stuff to me. Does God serve justice on bad people? You know, this karma thing is a Hindu doctrine. Yeah. So those of us who are Christians aren't waiting for karma to hit somebody. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the wheel of you going around and karma will come back. You get bad karma. No way. Look, you're foolish. You're living with this guy for so many years. You're picking up the tab for his meals and he, he's living on you. And, and you, you, he's a freeloader and you, you're discouraged because he walks out on you. Uh, he's a bum. Why don't you act like that? You know, he's what he is. Why do you get all torn up about it? You made a bad call. And I recommend you recover from it. So he went off and got married. So rather than waiting for some cosmic event to strike him down, why don't you just get on with your life and serve the Lord and forgive. When you have all against any, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. Forgive him, okay? Okay, and come to the Lord in the process. I'm yeah. not sure she, uh, yeah, she, is she did. I mean, she started living with this guy, and they weren't married, and and he, he had and he, four kids by so many other oh, women. Oh man, and, yeah, and, and she's choice. waiting for karma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the wheel of know. fate to yeah. come around. He's I got know. good karma and yeah. bad karma. That's ridiculous. All right, let me show you something wonderful. I love Dallas. Dallas is a great city, and there's a church down in Dallas that is reaching the homeless population by taking its message to where the homeless live. Not inside a building, but outside in the church parking lot. It's called Soul Church, and it's performed this ministry for more than 20 years. Charlene Mar Aaron has this. Six days a week, this Dallas parking lot looks plain and unremarkable. Then on Sundays, it transforms into something special. You've heard the children's rhyme. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the door and here are all the people. Well, here on this hot Dallas city parking lot, there's a church without walls aimed at ministering to the invisible people, the homeless. For 22 years, Soul Church has used praise songs to send a message that it's here to feed mind, body, and soul. And there's much feeding to be done. Statistics show homeless camps here have multiplied from just 40 to 200 in the last two years. Pastor Leon Burt heads Soul Church. This is it right here. It looks like a parking lot right now. But uh, we get here at 5 o'clock in the morning. We start setting up all these different tents. We've got like uh, 10 tents over there, and then a whole bunch of tents over the people that are eating. We have a live band every weekend. The hurting and broken find open arms to welcome them. In my church, you know, you can come drunk, you can come strung out, and a lot of them do. And, and they have a, a repentive spirit, and they're broken. They just, they want to get back where they were, you know. And a lot of, you know, that some have been in church, some have never been in church, and uh, they just come here to get loved on. They're seeking acceptance. Something Pastor Bird knows well. 
I was, uh, I was free racing cocaine when I got saved, and I didn't care if I lived or died. And so I, I can understand where they're coming from. Hot meals are served along with the gospel. And while the menu has changed over the years, the message remains the same. We started off with 10 gallons of coffee and a basket of donuts. Now it's feeding hundreds of people at one time. Really good food like salmon and you name it. No place I'd rather be. Since it began, Seoul has never canceled a service because those who need it always show up. If it's raining, we have hefty bags. We poke our head through the top, my arms through the sides. That's our sole attire. Okay, <laughs> that's our sole attire. Plenty of hefty bags. And then uh, we'll be dancing in the rain, getting crazy. Snow and ice, it doesn't matter. Got to be here every weekend. That's one thing they can count on for sure. Sunday morning, there'll be somebody here. Well, let's bless the Lord one more day, amen. Pastor Jeffrey Parker says those attending their services come from all ages and backgrounds. The demographics you have from, from 16 year olds to 70 and 80 year old, it really breaks my heart when I see our seniors living amongst uh, this population in homelessness, uh, some of them without any hope, some of them very sick. Still, he sees the ministry making a strong impact. We begin to see the testimonies of them getting jobs now and them moving into their own apartment now and them showing up at Bible study now. And so all of these are, are evidence and signs that, you know, what they've professed on Sunday, they begin to walk it out during the week. And so we see life change taking place here. Deborah McKernan once blamed God for the death of her two children and wanted nothing to do with church. After serving time for drugs and prostitution, the outdoor church literally called out to her. Living in a nearby shelter and annoyed by the music, she decided to pay a visit. Actually stomped over here to tell them, turn your stupid music off. And I walked onto this parking lot and I didn't realize I was in church. And it drew me in and I saw people, I saw love is what I saw. And with that, I saw no judgment. Everybody was just like me, broken, just broken. And I, I started staying later and later, you know, and eventually I, I found Jesus on this parking lot. And now I know that God positioned me here because he knew I was not ready to walk into a church with walls. I couldn't do it. Today, Deborah serves at the church. You know, I still have a long way to go. You know, I still, I'm yeah, still a mess, learn. but I am not where I was. Work in progress. We I are. am, <laughs> I am, and it is all because of the Lord. I gave him nothing and he still gave me his everything. And I can't, I can't think of enough. Just some of the reasons and miracles that keeps Bird spreading hope one soul at a time. And any given weekend, there'll be 30, 40 people that come up to get prayer commit themselves to the Lord. I just pray that this goes on for a long time. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Dallas. I love this church. I love what they're doing. I love the concept. You know, if you had to sum up the mandate Jesus gave all of us, they're doing it. You could just say, go ye. You know, that's what he said, go. Go to where they are, those who don't know me, those who are struggling, those who are hurting, and bring the message of my love. Set the captive free. So we love what this Church Without Walls is doing. And I uh, just want to encourage you in your own life when God gives you an opportunity to go. Go where people are hurting and help them find Jesus. Well, up next, a young woman with a rare disorder who fought back against the online bullies. I knew deep down I was not going to let those people become the definition of who I was meant to be. Lizzie Velasquez shares her inspirational story, and that's next. Lizzie Velasquez is a motivational speaker who's been called courageous. Unfortunately, she's also been called far, far worse. But throughout her entire life, she's endured cheeses and taunts. And yet, Lizzie has remained strong and in the process inspired millions of people along the way. Someone 
posted a video calling me the world's ugliest woman. Over four million views. I saw the comments. If you are gonna be so ugly, why didn't your parents abort you? Can you please just find a gun and kill yourself? I read every one because I was determined and desperate to find one comment that said, you don't know her story, or she's just a kid, or anything, and I didn't find that at all. Lizzie Velasquez was born with neonatal prodroid syndrome, a disorder that prevents her from gaining weight, weakens her bones and heart, and causes blindness in her right eye. Her parents did their best to make her feel normal. I remember them sitting me down and saying, first of all, there's nothing wrong with you. The only difference is that you're smaller than the other kids, and you're brave enough and strong enough to do whatever you put your mind to. Public school was a rude awakening, and Lizzie was bullied because of her appearance. A lot of it was just name calling, pork chop legs, and grandma, and why are you so skinny, and pointing in the stairs. Oftentimes, there were no words said to me, but it hurt as much as someone screaming something hateful to me with the megaphone. Away from school, Lizzie's only refuge was her family and God. My faith was something that was instilled in me from day one. If I was at church, I was the happiest kid in the world. When Lizzie entered middle school, the bullying intensified, and so did her frustration. How come I can only see out of one eye? How come my clothes don't fit like the other kids? How come I can't do this and can't do that? No matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I prayed, no matter what I did, I was not going to look like everybody else. Lizzie joined an after-school club to try to win over her peers. It was there she realized she needed to change her attitude. What am I doing? Nobody did this to me on purpose. Lizzie, stop whining, stop complaining. God is the reason why I'm here. If I'm gonna continue on this faith journey, I need to actually walk it. I have God here with me and he's not leaving this path. And if he's not leaving this path, neither am I. From that point forward, things began to change. I was really happy. Everything was going well. I had incredible best friends around me. Lizzie's confidence grew but she wasn't prepared for what would happen her junior year of high school. I don't think I'll ever be able to adequately describe what I felt in that moment. I was really confused and upset and angry. What in the world do I do now? I worked so hard to get my confidence up to where I was. Now that doesn't even exist. I knew deep down I was not going to let this video or those people become the definition of who I was meant to be. Lizzie immersed herself in church and school. Later, she was asked to share her story with the freshman class. She was apprehensive, but the next morning, she stood up in front of 400 students and spoke. Halfway through, I looked up and I realized that everyone was just listening. It was silent in there. And in that exact very moment, I had never felt more comfortable and confident in my own skin. And I realized we all know what it's like to be bullied. We all know what it's like to feel like you're not good enough or pretty enough or strong enough. When Lizzie finished speaking, she finally felt she understood God's plan for her life. I looked up and there was like a line of students who were wanting to come up and hug me and telling me how much my story touched them. I get chills thinking about it because it was just like this moment of like, I'm gonna be okay. That was the day that I found my purpose. 
For the next five years, Lizzie shared her story at churches and conferences nationwide. Then in 2013, another video of her went viral. This time, it was a TED Talk she gave on self-image that garnered over 10 million views. I wasn't doing this to like be famous. I was doing this to share a message. The whole speech, every word that came out of my mouth was a God thing. It wasn't me. Now Lizzie speaks around the world, hosts her own YouTube channel, and has written several books. In Dare to Be Kind, Lizzie shares how to overcome life's challenges. I feel like Jesus put me in this little body to show people that no matter what size you are or where you come from or what you go through, there is a God who is there who will never leave you and that will surpass any obstacle. Lizzie Velasquez, her body may be little, but her spirit is giant. How wonderful to figure out what you're here for, to be willing to be an inspiration, to be bold in your message, and to guard your heart against those who would diminish you. Lizzie, you go. You've got something to say, girl, and we're listening. If you'd like to read more from Lizzie, be sure to pick up a copy of her book. The title is Dare to be Kind, A Message for All of Us. It's available wherever books are sold. Well, still ahead on today's program, fresh water for a scorched village, and it's all thanks to people like you. See how it's changed one mother's life. That's next. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. Vice President Mike Pence left an NFL game Sunday after about a dozen players from the San Francisco 49ers took a knee during the national anthem. The former Indiana governor attended to watch Peyton Manning's jersey retirement, but then left after the anthem. He tweeted, I left today's Colts game because the president and I will not dignify any event that disrespects our flag, our soldiers, and our national anthem. Well, two of CBN Asia's children TV shows joined the biggest annual book fair in the Philippines this year. The Manila International Book Fair aims to spread the joy of reading to children. And this time, Superbook's Gizmo and characters from another Filipino program came along. There was a meet and greet with viewers to launch a children's book, which included a storytelling session. CBN Asia was able to join the book fair because of its partnership with Christian publishers and bookstores. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. We'll be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Takao is a woman who's a mother. Her children were sick, they were starving, and it was all because of a lack of clean water. Some days, all she and her family had to eat were tree leaves, but not anymore, thanks to a partnership between CBN and Innovation Africa. Many days, Teko walks four miles to the river to fetch water. One day, animals trampled the water. I was so thirsty and too weak to look further, so I drank it, but I couldn't give it to my children. They fell asleep crying. With barely enough water to drink, growing crops is practically impossible. When there's nothing else, people gather tree leaves to eat. We don't eat it all. I save some for later. Without water, everything is dirty. My children are always sick. Sometimes they cough up blood. I wonder why God gave me my children. I would rather suffer alone than see them suffer. Tako works hard every day to provide for her children. She and many others cut grass to sell in the market. After cutting and bundling the grass and walking sometimes five miles or more to the market, a woman can expect to sell one bundle for about 30 cents. That's the price of a small handful of tomatoes. There was a day that no one would buy the grass. I walked all the way back home, hoping someone would let us borrow some food, but no one had anything. 
When CBN and Innovation Africa started drilling just outside their village, the news spread quickly. Their search for clean water had finally ended. Oh, it's good. So this is just a temporary tap. We're actually installing nine permanent taps total. What we're doing is building a tall water tower over here, and that's going to give us the pressure we need to pipe water a mile in that direction and a mile in that direction. So 5,000 people in three villages are all going to have fresh, clean water just a few steps from home. God sent you to rescue us. This is the first time in my life to have water this close. Next time you visit, you will see tomatoes, onions, and other vegetables growing for us to eat and to sell in the market. Thanks to CBN and Innovation Africa, Tako's family and many others now have good nutritious food to eat and fresh, clean water right at their fingertips. Today, thirst is 1,000 miles away from us. Now my children can simply walk to the temp and drink. I can finally clean everything. I want to thank the people of America in the name of Jesus Christ. May God bless all of you. Thank you, 700 Club members, because when she says thank you to people in America, she's talking about you. You're the ones who made that possible. Can you imagine walking miles every day to get water, lugging those heavy containers back? And it's dirty water. It's unpotable. It's not drinkable for your children. She shouldn't have had it herself. Many people die because of that. Then you put a bunch of grass together and you haul that five miles and it doesn't sell that day. Life is difficult in so many parts of the world. To be able to bring clean drinking water isn't just meaning they can drink clean water. They can cook. They can clean their homes. They can clean their utensils and dishes. They can plant. They can raise all of their own food. You bring dignity to people. Join the 700 Club today. It's so simple. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. And our line is toll free. It couldn't be easier. Call 1-800-700-7000. Say, I'd like to join the 700 Club today. When you do, our way of saying thank you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest. It's called Ask Anything. On this program, we answer many of your email questions. This is filled with life's probing questions and biblical answers for you. We want you to have it. We think it'll build your faith. So call now. Well, Candace Curry runs a blog whose posts have gone viral, and she's been featured on shows like The Today Show and Good Morning America. She's transparent about the brokenness that she endured throughout her life and how she found a way to put it all back together. As a little girl, I just thought he hung the moon and that I had the best dad ever. About middle school is when I started to realize that he was different from the other dads. Candace Curry's dad was a con man, a scammer who refused to get a job. And even though her mom was the one who worked hard as a nurse to provide for the family, Candace craved her father's love and approval. No matter what I did, it, nothing was ever good enough. I would have done anything that he asked um, to please him so that he would want to be with me or like me or love me or think I was cool. He started giving me drugs in high school and I took them because I wanted him to like me. One night when she was 16, Candace was raped by a friend of her father's. When her dad found out, Candace expected he would defend her. Instead, he threatened that if I ever told, he would make my life a living hell. He threw me under the bus so that he wouldn't get in trouble with my mom. And so I think that was when I realized that I had zero value to him. The revelation was devastating. That, I think, is when I really built a wall up and stopped trusting anybody. Why would anybody else see any redeeming qualities in me if he couldn't? And so it changed me. It hardened me. The pain of her dad's rejection stayed with Candace for years. I just didn't think I was good enough for anybody. And as soon as somebody good got close, then I would intentionally destroy it. I made horrible decisions and destroyed healthy relationships so that they wouldn't get any closer. After high school, she started working in the restaurant business. Then on impulse, got married in Vegas and soon had a daughter. But the marriage didn't last, and a few years later, 
She met Brandon at work. I just totally fell in love with him because he was so kind to me and so good to me and so good to my daughter that I, I mean, I couldn't help it. I just hadn't experienced that. No one had come to me and loved on me without expecting something from me. The two married, excited about their future together. Within a year, Candace had triplets, but the couple wasn't prepared for the changes or financial demands that followed. I was a very different person than the day we got married. Physically, I had had three babies, so um, having three babies takes a toll on your body. And so I did not feel pretty. I was growing bitter because he was gone all the time, and I was at home with these babies, and it was very hard. And he was bitter because he was working like crazy, and we couldn't get ahead. I wasn't very good to him. I pushed him away because um, fear and um, exhaustion. We were exhausted. During that time, Candace's oldest daughter started going to church after a cousin signed her up for the choir. I started taking her to church purely out of obligation to my daughter and not, not as a desire um, for myself. God was for perfect people. I think growing up, I just thought um, you had to fit a certain mold for God to know you. That summer at Vacation Bible School, her daughter gave her life to Christ. It kind of rocked me, you know. I hadn't been any example of Christ to her. And here she was like all in, but she went to this church and was listening to who Jesus was and how much he loved her. And she was like, amen. I wanted her bravery and I wanted her confidence in Jesus. Something started softening about me, sitting in and listening to who Jesus was. Meanwhile, she carried the guilt of her marriage and family falling apart. We were failing our kids and we were just failing at life and I wasn't a good wife to him. And so um, that was scary because uh, I knew he deserved better than me. Who I had become wasn't who he chose to marry. The couple decided to divorce. Then Candace says God spoke to her. That's the moment that I realized that God knew me it was the first time that I heard God, and I didn't hear him audibly. I just, it was in my heart, and he said, you know, you've been, you've been looking for me, and here I am, and I'm gonna show you what it's like to be my daughter. And if you want your husband to know what you've been experiencing, then you're gonna have to be his example and you're gonna to have to show him what forgiveness and unconditional love really looks like. And I did not wanna hear that. Candace reached out to her husband and they reconciled. They also began attending church as a family. It changed our whole world, our entire world. We both gave our life to Christ and were baptized together. Candace says she has found complete acceptance and purpose in Christ. He takes all of our little broken pieces and he turns them into this beautiful stained glass where the light shines through and creates just the most amazing picture. You can come to him exactly the way you are. You do not have to clean up and make yourself right. That's what he does. That's why he sent Jesus. He takes away our sins so that we don't have to carry him. Actually, the reason we come to him and need to come to him and the reason his arms are outstretched is because we're all broken people. We're all broken people. You know, for Candace, it was the lack of ever feeling like her dad loved her, cared about her, and almost emotional abuse and all of that. And I don't know what it is for you, but you know, sometimes one of the things that keeps us from God is we've been so wounded by other people and by life that we're afraid to believe that Jesus could really be as good as he is. You know, what if I give him everything? What if I trust him and it doesn't work out? And I would say, what if? What have you got to lose? What if you don't trust him? You've got nothing, nothing. You will never find someone who's gonna be enough to fill that empty hole inside of you. You'll never be able to fix it yourself. 
You see, we aren't supposed to. God created you and me with a plan and a purpose in mind. The intention was for us to have relationship with him. That's how it started, you know. He created Adam and Eve in a garden, and every day they walked together. But we went our own way. And yet, the God of the universe stretches his arms out, waiting, saying, please come home to me. I want to fix that. I want to love that hurt out of you. I want to fill that emptiness inside of you. I want to help you become what you were created to be. Not judgment, but mercy, love, and forgiveness. Where are you going to find that? There's only one place. And you don't have to go into a church to find that. You can do it right now, this moment. Just stop what you're doing. Lift up your hands, open your heart, and say, Jesus, I get it, and I want you. You see, he's been saying he wants you all along. Now you tell him you want him. Ask him to forgive you for the things that you know you've done that have been wrong. We all shed tears, just like Candace was, for the things we did that were wrong. But don't walk away today without finding forgiveness and a new beginning for those things. That's God's promise to you. Now you take hold of it. Grab it, receive it and let him begin to change you. Get into the Word of God. It'll make a difference. We've got a packet for you called A New Day. It's filled with information from the Word of God. It's yours for the asking, completely free. So is the phone number. We want to leave you with these words from Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me.